in particular, I want to discuss some things related to the basic space. At the beginning of algebraic geometry. Vector in this vector space can be written in coordinates. Let's even emphasize that. And in fact, let's emphasize the fact that these zi's are linear functionals on space. And so we have a mapping which sends a vector to its coordinates. Of course, an isomorphism from V to Cn. And it sends the line spanned by this vector, so it's not zero, to the, what we call homogeneous coordinates. means that this vector is, uh, this homogeneous coordinates is the equivalence class of this vector modulo uh, dilation. So, in this line, you get the same equivalence class. And so the projective space, which is the set of one-dimensional subspaces, so we often say that it's a set of lines, but we really need subspace, is, can be really thought of as just being parameterized by these homogeneous equivalents. charts on this projective space uh, are U, say L, and that's the set of vectors such that ZL of the vector is not zero, and uh, just this set of L walks in here. I have just been dedicating this to you, to your size here. I often write that. Sit down. Uh, that's an open set. And if you're in this set, so if we are in this set, so a line in this set, which is homogeneous coordinates in this set, Cn 
this is the coordinate map. And we call this PL, and this identifies uh, UL with CN is a very big chart. Very, very big. The complement of it is where ZL is equal to zero, and it's a very small set. And it's defined by the equation ZL equals zero, which is an algebraic equation. So the complement is closed in the algebraic sense. The algebraic closed sets are defined by rational functions. Now I, I hear a question someplace. How do you cover zero? Hmm? How do you cover zero? What do you mean how do I cover zero? Zero doesn't seem in any of the yields. Yeah, because that's important that zero is not there because uh, we're discussing the space of lines. I mean, maybe let me see what is your what do you mean? Say it again, please. How you? So zero is not a projective. Zero is not in the projective space. Huh? No, a point in projective space oh, okay. is a one-dimensional subspace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. yeah, you see. So, so v in the beginning should be non-zero. That's right. If we took, take v equal to zero, we, we, <laughs> we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We have to take it to generate the line. Okay. That's the point. That's the reason your question is good. <clears throat> so it, it generates the line, and, and so and then we get these coordinates. So uh, you can check that the, that the, the coordinate change of coordinates Uh, say uh, from uh, ui uh, j, if you like, uh, to uji, these are the intersections of these two sets, maybe we call this pij. It's, it's simply, if you look at it, what it really is, it's probably zj, zi over zj, I think. You have to check whether it's zi over zj or zj over zi. It's this rational change of course. So everything here is algebraic, and this is indeed an algebraic structure on the space. Uh, okay, that's projective space. So the special case that you've seen already, of course, is the um, is the Riemann sphere. And so P one C. So this is the projective space of P two of C two. And uh, the po a point here, we, we've used notation, a point here has coordinates, homogeneous coordinates, Z0, Z1. And we have two sets, U0 and U, I'll write them out long, so U0 is where Z0 is not equal to 0, and U1 is where Z1 is not equal to 0. Here, so here uh, z0 is not equal to 0, so we can normalize this coordinate, z0, and call it 1. Okay, if you want, I'll write here z0 over z1, and the coordinate map takes that to, I mean z1 over z0, takes it to that. So that's the coordinate there. And maybe we call this z. And here, uh, if we have take, take one here, then we know z1 is not equal to 0, so we can divide by that so that we can go to z1, uh, uh, z0 over z1. And maybe we call this coordinate zeta. And the change of coordinates, obviously, how do you go from z to zeta? So zeta, if you visualize on the intersection, is a function of z, which, as you see, is 1 over z. So this is well known to you. Uh, I think. Um, so it has the big open set. Let's say the North Pole is uh, where Z0 is 0. No, I, I prefer the word I don't know. It doesn't matter. Where Z0 is 0. Let's call it 0. And the South Pole is maybe where Z1 is 0. And we call this infinity. And <coughs> So, uh, actually, to be consistent with complex analysis in one variable, 
probably I will call this infinity. And this zero. Um, let me make sure. Yes. Because this, this, this variable is used for the usual coordinate on com complex plane. And where this variable is zero is, is here, one zero. So this is the complex plane. We have got this thing set up. Is, is this one is where, uh, yes, so the complex plane is usually the z plane, which I guess is where uh, uh, is u0. Right. And the origin in u0 is this one. And infinity is that. So you've done this all your life uh, in the complex analysis. Okay, so um, that's a global thing, and I would like now to talk uh, about meromorphic functions on these global things. These manifolds. In general, uh, so if X is a complex manifold, that means real manifold where the charge have values in Cn and the change of variables is holomorphic. Then a meromorphic function, and we'll use the notation M of X, it's a space of meromorphic functions. Um, let's just for fun here take it to be connected, uh, which makes life a little bit on the formal base easier because then this is a field. And this is called the function field of the manifold. You see, if it's not connected, you have divisors of zero. You have zero on this component, and one on this component, and it's crazy. So take it to be connected, and then it's really a field. So we call this the function field of the manifold X. Let's recall what the definition is. So what is M? M means. Uh, uh, this, there is a covering I will be sets, of course, u alpha of x and on each u alpha you have meromorphic functions but of a, a special form, namely the quotient of two holomorphic functions O of u alpha is my notation for the uh, ring of holomorphic functions. By the way, a, this was, notation was introduced by Serre, and the reason it's called O, you will enjoy this, is because uh, H does not exist in French. And when, when you speak in French, you say holomorphie. And so, so he, he, called, he called it O. I, I don't know if it's a true story. I think it's a nice thing. So anyway, these are the holomorphic functions. And now here in this case, where this is a manifold, we, we can take, we can choose... Um, ML plus are restrictions? Or? What? ML plus are restrictions? Or? What about restriction? M alpha is a restriction or, or what? This is no, M alpha, M alpha is a function on U alpha. Okay. And, okay? If you like, M alpha is a pair of functions on U alpha. Um, okay, and now I'm going to define M. So I haven't finished. I haven't finished the definition yet. So M, <clears throat> you may think, of course, that uh, M alpha is for sure the restriction, but M M is defined by M alpha. Okay. Okay, and you may choose. Uh, we may choose. Um, the M alpha to be relatively prime. The F alpha, uh, choose, the, choose F alpha and G alpha to be relatively prime. And in fact, you can choose this to be relatively prime everywhere on U alpha. So, let me just comment on this. This may look like a mysterious thing to you. <laughs> Let, let me demysterious, make, I don't know what the word is, make it less mysterious. Recall in one complex variable, for this statement, 
Um, without loss of generality in dimension one, um, we, uh, we may choose that these two functions, so I can localize and take the small f alpha. Uh, Well, let's say they choose f alpha and g alpha so that either f alpha is nowhere zero or g alpha is nowhere zero. This is completely clear because this definition is local and I can make, make it smaller and smaller. So I, I okay. So I, and, and then if they both happen to have zero at this point of consideration where I'm taking smaller, I cancel. This is the key thing at that, at that point, locally, it's a unique factorization domain. You can cancel, you can really cancel, you, you know, factor out and cancel. And the local ranks here, so you see what I did here. I localized, 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 and cancel. The same thing here, you can localize at one point, um, and in fact, you can uh, say the same thing as here, but you can't, you, you, you can't, you can say this thing. You see, this is the state everywhere, at every point, uh, what do you call it? I want to say, somebody speak German here, title friend, you, you're German. What is title friend in English? Uh, relatively prime. Yeah, relatively prime. So at each point, in each local ring, when you're looking at the functions, uh, here we, it was a joke. We just take these things small enough so either one, one vanishes or the other, and the other does not vanish. You see, this is a joke. But in several areas, you cannot do this because, you see, what happens is you have the situation of the zero set of of uh, f and and the zero set of g. Um, here's maybe the point of interest you you, you want to. Uh, it might be something like this. Uh, you can never ensure that they are both not zero at the same point. It's just impossible. What you can ensure is that they don't have any components which agree with each other because of their components which agree with each other. You can cancel. That's no proof, but that's the way you do deal with these matters in this local ring. Okay, you, you have to discuss irreducibility and so on, and it's it's uh, some fun, painful first remark in the, in the in the local theory. So all I'm just saying is you can always choose these things to be locally tied uh, uh, um, friends, relatively prime. Okay, that's the best you can do. Okay, and this is what Mihai is saying. What you're saying, what you expect here is, so the condition here is, is, well, let me just write it, is F alpha uh, G beta equals F beta G alpha, or minus equals zero on the intersection of these uh, open sets. That's the condition of compatibility uh, if, if you, well, you want to write it in the ring. You don't want to write it in the field here. You want to write this in the ring. And so, this, but in, in, in the way you're thinking, and then it's say the restriction of m alpha to u alpha beta, m beta to u alpha beta is equal. So it's compatible and globalizes in that sense, but only locally is, it is a quotient. Okay. That's the definition of a meromorphic function. So it is a field and so on. What? So where is M in this definition? Okay, M if you like, thank you. M if you like is is an equivalence class of coverings and local representations in this form. That's a very good question you're asking. 
What I wrote down for you on the blackboard is a representative of a meromorphic function. And now if you take another covering and another, say, U alpha hat, M alpha hat, you have to say what it means that these two things are equivalent. What it means, obviously, is you take a refinement of the two coverings and then take restriction maps uh, and everything. Okay. Did, you, did you explain in the, last, in the previous lecture how this fits with the definition of finitely many points where it vanishes in one dimension? I just explained it here. Well, I explained it here, not finitely, but discreetly many. Discreetly many. Yeah, because I just pointed out here, you can always localize uh, so that either one or the other is not zero. That's what I just said here. Okay. So uh, the identity principle is, of course, used here. Okay. So that's the notion of a meromorphic function field. And I hope today I can uh, give some examples. Uh, the first new idea, perhaps, I think is fundamental. I don't know who, where is Romania here? Oh, there it is. Is this, old, is this, oh, 1871. <laughs> yes. By the way, when I first came to Germany, you're German, I think. <laughs> we had dinner with the, some members of the old German military, and he pulled out such a map and explain to me where the definition of German, <laughs> how it should be. And that definition is also on this map, if you want to take a look at it. For example, do you notice, for example, the Danzig, Königsberg, maybe you know Königsberg, there's some very famous mathematicians in Königsberg. You know some of them, right? Well, I think maybe Hilbert. Kant was also in Königsberg, right? Huh? Yes, but Euler, he went to the Schweiz to make money, like everybody. <laughs> then he left to go to Berlin. He got in a fight with somebody, was it, I don't know, Friedrich Ergolz, one of the, the, somebody like this, and uh, got mad for some reason, and then went to Leningrad, and to St. Petersburg. But the famous for the five or seven bridges of Königsberg. Right. But it was already, but he was a big shot, you know. I mean, he had 20 assistants and so on. So that's not enough for me. We only have five or six. I don't even know what the idea was I was going to talk about. Here. I got distracted by this. I got distracted by this map. Okay, an idea, an idea which I think is a fundamental idea, and I don't know how to uh, contribute this idea to somebody, is in dimension one, yeah, that, that a memoir. Function is a map is a holomorphic map let me call it by the same letters M from X to P1 it's a holomorphic map and now I'm going to be a little bit careful with the notation. I'm going to put a half arrow here because there's some very interesting things that happen in higher dimensions. But let's first talk about it in dimension one. Okay? We're just intuitively in dimension one. So watch this. On U alpha, so if this thing is given to you on U alpha, this guy, at least in your head, is F alpha divided by G alpha with these two things relatively prime at every point of consideration. So, I mean, after all, what that means is that we're looking at these things homogeneously. All right? That's what it means. In that first coordinate chart, that's really what that means. Yeah? And you see in dimension one, in dimension one, either this is not zero or this is not zero. We can localize that situation. 
So that means that this map is well defined in dimension one. This is uh, Mihai's point before. He was worried about where is zero here. <laughs> if both of these things are in zero, for example, in my little picture here, at this point here, there's some trouble. We call that a point of indeterminacy, and I don't want to really talk about that. But let's think about it in dimension one. At least this is, uh, this is well defined. And of course, whole morphy, you can just check it. Most places, so let me emphasize, uh, uh, as long as either f alpha or g alpha is not zero. It's one or the other is not zero. But you see, that means in most places it's okay. It's only bad where they're, they, both their zero sets intersect. Let me just state for the, your benefit in higher dimensions, where you, this problem really happens, difficulties really happen. In, in one dimension, they don't happen. So in higher dimension, where difficulties really occur. Let me just mention, f equals 0, intersect g equals 0. You will notice that these sets are well defined, where these sets are 0 are well defined. So where that happens is, uh, is two codimensions. I mean, really, you should think whatever the devil that means. If they're smooth and transversal, it means it's a two-codimensional complex manifold. If you think over the real numbers, this is four real codimensional, so it's very small. In this case, where I drew, drew some pictures of singularities, math, measure theoretically, and everything in every regard, this, these intersection points have, have size co-dimension 2, complex co-dimension 2, or real co-dimension 4. Okay, so this is only a small set, but an interesting set. Okay, where these things uh, could be zero. So let's look <coughs> at the, uh, let's not look at that right now, let's just look at the one-dimensional K. By the way, let, let me call this set here I of M for fun, and you call it the indeterminacy set of this mapping M. I mean, you don't know what the value is. It's not infinity, it's not zero, you don't know what to say. So it's indeterminate. So this indeterminacy set is two codimensional. So let's look at the one dimensional, one -dimensional case where everything's okay. So, the meromorphic functions on such a thing is simply the holomorphic maps from x to p1. So, it's really well defined, no indeterminacy, just the holomorphic maps from x to p1. So, we should really study that phenomena carefully. Holomorphic maps from x to p1. For, it's a big breakthrough in mathematics here to forget that that's a function. You should think of it as a map. I think it's a big breakthrough. I think the open mapping theorem is a big breakthrough. The fact that a holomorphic function is a mapping is a big breakthrough. This is, this is I think, due to Schwartz, and I think it's due to Schwartz in the early 20th century. I mean, not long ago. I think Riemann maybe didn't think that way. Okay, uh, Riemann understood everything, so I, I, I'm sure Gauss did not. He talked about conformal mappings, but he did nowhere did he talk about open mappings. Yeah. And it, it's, it's difficult to say. The, the language at the time was something else. So anyway, I shouldn't probably conjecture that question. Yeah. Um, what is the P1 here? Uh, what is the 
Projective space of functions? Is it no, projective one-dimensional complex projective space. Here, I wrote, so let me say it again. If, let's look at the top. The idea is, if you take all these local things, then you can write locally that, and it gives you this this thing into, into that's homogeneous coordinates. So that's really in P one of C. But F R and G R are functions. They're not complex numbers. How could it be? Yeah. No. Given a point, F alpha is a number associated with that point, and G alpha is a number. Okay. So the pair. Let, let's go through this again. This is, I'm glad you asked. The pair is a vector in C two. Mm -hmm. Right. So that vector in C2 determines a line, a one dimensional subspace. And if you're looking at the ratio, F alpha divided by G alpha, right, that line and that ratio are the same thing, right? So we have a map to P1 of C, or P of C2. That's the map. And the compatibility condition here means is well defined. Okay, it doesn't matter what you choose. Of course, we choose these things to be relatively prime. That means in the case of one dimensional case, either one or the other is not zero. So that really makes sense. Okay. So it is, and I guarantee you, it is better to think of these things as maps. I guarantee it. Okay. So, and of course, they're just the holomorphic maps to P1. So let me, I'll go back up so quickly. So let me talk about a picture of a holomorphic map. So this is a secret picture, but this secret picture you find explicitly in Riemann's papers. So this is exactly the way Actually, Riemann understood everything. It's just incredible. So a picture of, of a holomorphic map. F from one uh, where uh, dimension x equals dimension y. So the first thing in this picture is you have an upstairs space and a downstairs space. I always have uh, my downstairs space will look like that. Again, this is it. if you draw a real picture of this, this is perhaps uh, something like this. I don't know how it's like, but this is this is a schematic picture of a one-dimensional complex manifold, okay? And now the upstairs, so now if you have a point down here, let's simplify this. My, most of my discussion will be uh, completely general, but let, let's just uh, say here, for simplicity, x and y are compact and connect. And just to make sure you have, you don't get upset about something, and f is non-constant. Let's take that case, and if you understand that case, it's good enough. Okay? That was not, you know, this is the first thing. I come to Germany, and I have all these great, great uh, uh, view of this great German complex analyst, you know. And I give some lecture. I give a lot of lectures around. The first thing these guys ask me about is, is the map constant or not? <laughs> I said, you have to be kidding me. <laughs> right? The map is non-constant, otherwise I wouldn't be in this room. <laughs> right? Come on. Come on, give me a break. So the map is non-constant. The map is therefore an open mapping, right? Because everything is connected. Right? The map is therefore in this compact case subjective, because it's a map of the image is compact and open. So everything's connected, so it's subjective. So this map is subjective. 
So every point here has pre-image. Otherwise, if this stuff is not going back, it may not be subjective. So here's the map of the top disk. It always goes from top to bottom. And of course, the pre-image has some points. The pre-image has is discrete because if it had accumulation points, the identity principle says its map is constant. The ma upstairs manifold is compact, therefore the pre-image is finite. Okay. So the pre-image looks like this. I don't know. Now there, in life, there are good things and bad things. Right. For example, the weather is bad from my point of view. Okay. <laughs> seen worse. Huh? See, I've seen much worse than this. Yes, that's true. <laughs> okay, so we have good points and bad points. So, you know, I think we should be optimistic. Let's look at a good point. So let's call this uh, be good. Uh, that means that the map does not ramify over P. That means that at every point here, the <coughs> map is a maximal rank. So a mapping has a Jacobian. A Jacobian, if you like, well, the mapping has a differential. The differential in this case is a one by one matrix if you write it in a coordinate because it's a holomorphic differential. I mean, you're talking about maps which are complex and linear locally. So this has a differential which is a mapping from a one dimensional tangent space to another. And it has a rank. And the rank of that map is either zero or one. Okay. Locally speaking, that is whether a number is zero or one. This number is or not zero. This number is, whole, is a holomorphic number. It varies analytically with the function. Therefore, it only vanishes on a finite set. So there are only finitely many bad points up there, and so we remove them at first. Look at the good stuff first. That's the lesson you learn. Look at the good stuff first, throw out the bad stuff, and then understand the whole thing by analytic continuation going back to the whole thing. So I'll throw out the bad stuff, understand what happens, and then go back to the whole thing by analytic continuation of the whole thing. So there'll be some bad points over here. That's a bad point maybe here, here, I don't know, here, here, here. Let's say that there's so many bad points. And these are all good. That means the mapping has constant rank 1 here. That means it's an open mapping here, which is locally the mapping z. Because locally every mapping is z to the k. And so it's a question what k is. And since the Jacobian doesn't vanish, k is 1. So this is, in fact, z. In fact, this identifies here a neighborhood of that point with downstairs. We say it is unramified, unramified at such points. So, so if I take a good point where there are no ramifications over that point, that means I take a non-critical point in the sense of uh, Morse theory or the sense of anything, non-critical image value, non-critical value is what one says. Yeah. Then it is there are no critical points above it, and you can choose it to be a covering map over that point. Okay. Now, here <clears throat> is another point. Uh, this point here is a bad point because it has a ramification point over it. That means there is, in this case I chose one picture over it, one point over it ramified. So there may be other good points here. I mean, maybe here, maybe there's only one bad uh, ramification point here. So uh, uh, who knows? I mean, I don't know. Maybe over here that these so good, so good, and so on. Let's say something like this. Now let us say. Now we go to this bad point. We go to this ramification point. I go there and look at it with a microscope. Okay, I just went there. So. Locally, I told you this morning, you know it very well. Locally, a map is z to the k. 
That means there's a number k associated with that map at that point. k, z to the k, has one zero and is nearby k to one. Right? So let's say this is nearby, uh, I don't care, two to the one. Well, that's how it looks. So what happens here, let's, let's just uh, have fun here and say that in that fiber here, there are three points. Yeah, and this ramification number here is two. So this, uh, I don't know whether the ramification is two or one. Let's just leave the picture right now. So there are four points. And here this ramifies here. You leave the point a little bit, go into genericity. I told you this morning, please go to genericity. You leave this point a little bit, you go up here, and it's again 4 to 1. See, you leave the point here a little tiny bit. Let's read it a little bit. And we go here nearby. We have to go to a small neighborhood nearby, but otherwise we get hooked with this ramification. And this thing is then again 4 to 1. Here it is 4 to 1 in a big neighborhood of this good point. We don't know where the bad points are. Well, <laughs> what happens here is that you stay, you, you're on this good stuff and you move here toward this bad point. So we're moving toward this bad point from the good point. And in between, there are no bad points. If you don't hit, hit ramification, you could continue on, and what's going to happen is you're going to do this, and then finally you're going to come to a ramification point. So what's going to happen is this. Okay. So I want to mention here, just for fun, you have a number one here because it's one to one. You have a number one here because it's one to one. You have a number one here because it's one to one. It's number one here is one to one. You have the number one here is it's one to one. And you have number two here is two to one. You have the number one here. By deep thought, you notice that one plus one plus one is four. And this is the four to one covering map generically. If you count with multiplicity, one plus two plus one is also four. Uh, you go over here, maybe what could happen is a tragedy here. You could have some awful thing happen to you here. Uh, I don't know how this could look like this, but you could very well have that happen. If you go over here, and, the, and this ramification is 4 to 1, but it is an obvious fact that if you count the number of points in each fiber with multiplicity, it is constant. Right? You can just check it. So there is a number associated to this mapping, which is the number 4. The degree of this mapping is 4, and it is a very, very strong statement. The degree of the mapping is a concept of, of differential calculus. This degree of the mapping states that outside of a finite set, which is the image of places where the Jacobian vanishes, which is called the branching set of this mapping, and it's downstairs. The branching set is downstairs. So, so B equals the bad points, the bad points downstairs. <clears throat> this is what is called the branching set of this mapping. And I always get confused between the branching set and the ramification set, which is upstairs. So the ramification set are these points upstairs where the Jacobian vanishes. With it. So, so rank f equals uh, the derivative equals zero, where the Jacobian really vanishes in local coordinates, is called the ramification set upstairs, where the map ramifies. And the way to remember that is b, the points downstairs, b is for base. <laughs> That's the only way I can remember it. Okay. So the base point set is downstairs. So now, what it states is, if you remove, so if, you, if this map is called f, and you look at the mapping x from f inverse of the branching set to y minus the branching set is a d to 1 polymorphic covering map. It 
It is not necessarily Galois. What that, is B? Hmm? What, what is B? Is the uh, I'm sorry, D is, yeah, thank you. So D will be the degree of this, whatever it is, in this case, 4. Okay? You just go to a generic point, count. Okay, how many points are in the fiber above it? Okay? Okay, so you can check that. That's a fundamental picture that, of course, uh, Riemann understood. By the way, from Riemann's point of view, a Riemann surface is the upstairs space. Okay? And for Riemann, it's very interesting. Riemann, if, he ask, if you ask him what is a function, for him, a function may be multiple values. And so the function may not, may not be defined, it may be something like this. You see, the value of this function could be the inverse of this function, it has four values, generically. Riemann was more, much more general than we are. His word for uh, honest to God function is uniform function. Multiple function could be 4 to 1 or 10 to 1. Because he wanted to understand square root, for example. See, he understood, wants to understand algebraic equations, and the, and the equations have the, 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 of two variables, and the equations have solutions which are multi, multi value. Right? So, this is his picture. Every holomorphic mapping is, in this sense, a cover. That's yeah. actually another question. Yeah. Here you discuss about the ramification points, but I intuitively understand that must use the implicit function theorem or rank theorem, but could you please explain more that why, like there are two lines intersecting that po at that point, what does it mean? Uh, I'm sure I use everywhere here the rank theorem. So let me see, uh, in this case it is so trivial that I almost don't call it the rank theorem. Let me just review what I use here, okay? Yeah. Can I please comment on something? Yeah, there you want to comment on the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I was in the course with him. Like, do you remember the, the theorem that if the derivative is not zero in one point, the function is ejected there around oh, the yeah. neighborhood? Yeah. So, because it's zero there, it has to not be injected, so it has to have at least... Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about this a little bit, because maybe you know. So, first of all, the Jacobi... <laughs> And the, the, the complex Jacobian is uh, just in, in, in local coordinates this. Okay? If you write the real Jacobian down, it will be the absolute value squared of that. Right? But this is a I call this the complex, this is a complex linear Jacobian. So it's in this case it's a number. Okay, and this number uh, is either zero or not zero. And if it's not zero, the mapping is locally f of z equals z. Yeah? What is it with you? Mihai, you have uh, something more? I just wanted to ask you if, like, in, in my head, holomorphic between two Riemann surfaces means locally holomorphic. Yes. That's what it means. Yeah. Like, you go to the charts yeah. and it's holomorphic on c. That's yeah. how you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Very good. Right. I, I did, yeah, please make these questions. Uh, Mm. Yeah. So you use the definition on C because you didn't get it. Sure, any sure. Mm. And, and and that's the point with holomorphic com compatibility. It means this definition is well defined. And holomorphic. Uh, how do you define holomorphic? I mean, I was not here in the that's beginning, okay. but I mean, you have a nice review. review. It's nice. <laughs> what does it mean that it's holomorphic in multi-dimension? Does it mean that it's holomorphic in each of the variables? Yeah, I talked about this this morning. So it means the d bar of it is zero as a function. And that means, say, the smoothest definition is let f be a smooth complex value function, smooth, and holomorphic in each of the variables. But Hartog's theorem tells you, with virtually no assumption, just holomorphic in each of the variables separately, and it follows that it's smooth. This is not at all clear, because you know there are discontinuous functions which are smooth in, in, in all of Okay. It's more, it's more powerful because it's about complex numbers, not about real numbers. Yes, absolutely. It's a very, very power, a powerful condition, particularly in higher dimensions, somehow. Yeah, that's very good. All these remarks I appreciate very much. Thank you. So I, are we okay on this centile? Mm -hmm. So this morning, again, I said that locally speaking, after a change of coordinates, every function is z to the k. And that's what I'm using here that I localize the discussion here as a function locally. That's what we just discussed. 
And it's just simply z to the k there, and in this case it's 2. Over here it's 4. Generically speaking, it's 1. Throw out the points where it's bigger than 1. And it's, of course, you have to, see, here, here it's 1 and here it's 1. But if you want a covering map, you have to throw all these things out here because, they're, they're, because of this one ramification. You have, must throw out, you see what I did? I threw out the pre-image of all the bad points downstairs. And it's now a k to 1. Okay. The statement is a holomorphic mapping from x to y in one variable has the same number of points in every fiber. <laughs> OK. Every fiber is finite, and it has the same number of points in every fiber. Alphimatic systems. What? Alphimatic systems. Kind of multiplicity, correct. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can write down a formula. What you do is you associate each point to multiplicity, and the statement is the sum of these numbers is a constant. And that's then the degree of this method. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, that's the story there. Um, so uh, a rough statement, uh, a, a corollary. Uh, every m in x has the same number of zeros as poles. Right? Because in that case, you do this, you say, well, the bound downstairs is p1, upstairs is x, maybe it's four to one like over there, and maybe here's infinity. So maybe it uh, has multiplicity three here. So it has a pull of order three and uh, a pull of order one at another point. And maybe over here is zero. And over here, uh, maybe uh, it has, uh, I don't know, uh, pull of order, a zero of order two and zero of order two. So that says the same thing as 2 plus 2 is the number of zeros, and 3 plus 1 is the number of poles. Okay. So, how? I mean, isn't 1 over x isn't the meromorphic function on the Riemann sphere? Yeah, so let's talk about that. So, a Mihai's example. Uh, if you don't mind, I will take z. <laughs> Just z. So z is a meromorphic function on P1. Let's check how it is. Well, we take on z0, on u0, m0 equals z. And on u1, m1 equals 1 over zeta. And on the overlap, z equals 1 over zeta. So it's globally defined. So what this says is this function z has a zero at the origin and a pole at infinity. Okay. One over, if you like, I will draw you, this is a biomorphic map. So here's p1, and here's p1, and here's, here's the base, and this is the function z. <laughs> It's one to one by holomorphic. Just match. What, what's the problem? Is there a problem? Okay. So any polynomial. Let's look at a polynomial. Okay. So it's you're just not used to this stuff. If you take any polynomial z. Say it's uh, a. Uh, now let's start it. Let's make it monic so that it doesn't. So a polynomial of degree d, a d, uh, d minus one d. You know such a polynomial. Right. Now we prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra says that here's p1, uh, 
and this has ramification and so on. I don't know. But uh, so this does the pole of order need infinity? Huh? Does the pole of order need infinity? Yeah. But every value is taken on d times. You see, the fundamental theorem of algebra is proved by the fact that this mapping is surjective. That means every value is taken on. And then by recursion, you prove that it, uh, it has so many zeros and so on. But by this whole thing here, is every value is taken d times. Uh, let's see if Mihai is right about that. Let's check this. I have to put in here a zeta, right? So this is equal to 1 over zeta to the d plus uh, 1 over zeta to the d minus 1, and so on. And I factor this out, 1 over zeta to the d, uh, 1 plus uh, some stuff here. So I'll write what it is. Uh, so it's this times a unit, which doesn't vanish. So as you point out, it has a full order d of infinity. Okay. So you easily check here, using these kind of arguments, that the meromorphic functions field of P1 is the field of rational functions in Z. Right? You just check it. Here's the proof. You can assume that given a rational fun uh, meromorphic function, it doesn't have a pole of infinity. Then you write down a polynomial with the right number of zeros on the complex number, with the right zeros on the complex plane, the poles on the complex plane, take the quotient, and this will be your function. Because you, and the point is, you really need the fact that you have the same number of zeros as poles, because then there won't be anything at infinity. Right? They cancel out. Right. So this is this fact, and when that's the first theorem of the course, that the function field on the complex number plane is just that. Okay. Hope you know that value distribution of non-compact manifolds is highly non-trivial. People that do dynamics know that very well, you see. The stupidest theorem is in the neighborhood of an essential singularity. Yes, you have the big Picard theorem, which says every value is taken on so many times and so on, and then in the neighborhood of an essential singularity. This is a very weak theorem. The, 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 the big theorem is that measure theoretically, there are, the fibers of this mapping are all the same except for maybe two. And then you get into so-called Nevin-Linda theory, which is much, much deeper. So, and this is only one-dimensional stuff, which is not, to me, not very interesting. So higher-dimensional stuff is much more interesting because you have the you have the dynamics of the curve, which is really moving. You see, it's a, you're talking about images which are curves, and how they intersect other curves and so on. That's the deep Neville theory in higher dimensions. Okay, but here we're in in, in very simple situation where everything is compact. <clears throat> Any questions at this point? I think we talked last year about same time. You okay at this stage? Yeah, good. Okay. A little bit uh, quick, but this is a, it's a very beautiful theory. <clears throat> and of course you notice I like it very much. <laughs> The right version of it is true, but you're going to see right away that there's some, immediately there's some delicate points. So I'll explain the first delicate point now. But you don't have discrete zeros of paradigms. That's that's really the end, and the two functions can uh, their zero set simultaneous zeros that can be something. Like I drew in that picture someplace. Yeah. So I'd like to discuss that. <clears throat> but before I do that, I, uh, 
Let me just uh, make one more remark in one dimension, which I love very much, so I'll, I'll make it. This is really a relevant remark, and it is very beautiful. This was written down by Riemann without proof, and was proved by Horwitz, and so it's called the so-called Riemann-Horwitz formula. Uh, I don't know who really proved it. Uh, really. Felix Klein certainly understood it. Uh, Uh, and it's in this context of what I'm now going to call ramified coverings. Okay? So, finite ramified coverings. We want to move this this. Well, you need to recall a simplistic definition of the order number. So still um, one in a one-dimensional case. The simplistic definition of Euler number is due to Euler. So Euler was optimistic and believed you could triangulate uh, any uh, surface. I doubt that he proved that. It's, it's a slightly interesting, particularly for topological surface. I, Anyway. Can you do that with non-orientable surfaces? Say it again, please. Can you do that with uh, non-orientable surfaces? Uh, I don't know. Probably. I, th I think I heard the theorem, but it is for... Well, I don't think that's... Uh, I don't think that's a problem. What's the point? Because you always have a two-to-one covering which is orientable. And now we just triangulate upstairs compatible with the covering. Right? Maybe it just doesn't say whether it works for non orientable surfaces or not. Oh, it, just, oh. It, just, it works for orientable surfaces. Well, I know, what you're, I know what you're going to say. The formula that I'm going to write down here is for orientable surface. Yeah? So, you know, the second homology of a non orientable surface is zero. Usually, the second hom homology or cohomology is one and it's generated by the volume form. Uh, this is a two-dimensional surface, so the cohomology, is, uh, you have the top orientation form. But if it's not orientable, the second cohomology is actually, uh, what is it, zero or it's Z2? I, I guess it's, it's even Z2. Anyway, I, I, I get, it. I, I get I nervous. Know. But you, you have, you're really right about this. You should always watch out for non-orientable stuff. I agree with you. So here, everything's orientable because it's complex analytic. The change of variables is holomorphic, and that is always, uh, the real Jacobian is always positive, right? Because it's uh, the absolute value square of the holomorphic transformation. Okay, so, but thank you for your remark. So Euler's definition, you know, is with the triangulation, so the, Euler, the topological Euler characteristic of X is the, is, uh, let me see in which language we are here. The number of, okay, let me try it in, you know, it's vertices minus edges plus faces. <laughs> uh, so we have the same letters uh, <laughs> of a triangulation. And I guess if you have a triangulation, if Euler had a triangulation, I think he proved that it's well defined. Uh, independent of the, of the triangulation. That's a fantastic fact. Right? Um, and. Um, Okay, and you can check that for uh, our x, which is the surface, that this topological Euler number of x is 2 minus 2g, where g, and we'll talk about this in great detail, so I'm just being rough now, is the number of handles. Uh, uh, to build a, X as a handle body. Now, 
in many ways, I mean, this is, you know, right at the beginning. I have to do something to get a definition. Let me just draw the picture of what, what I'm thinking about here. Um, you may look at something in genus 2 uh, like that, but somehow I, when I look at it like that, it's hard for me to say that it's genus 2. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. this is this 2 minus 2g is just in one complex dimension. I'm Jesus. I'm dealing. I'm still dealing. Still in one complex dimension. Okay. And, and, and it's good that you repeat me. <laughs> repeat that. Everything. I, there's only one topological invariant in dimension in for, uh, real dimension two. If it's right. <laughs> and that's the genus. And the genus you can think of as a number of hands. And, and it's better to think of as a number of hands. So the way to think about this is you take the sphere. And you take two holes in the sphere, and then you you attach a handle here, and take two other here take two other holes here, and attach a handle here. And it's very precise what it means to attach a handle. It means that the, this is a there's what we call a collar here, and it gets attached by this is an annulus, and there's a gluing map on the annulus which defines an equivalence relation, and this is the topological classification. And there is this number G, which is the number of handles. Um, but the address picture, the G should be one. G, G is two handles. I don't know. Two handles, two holes. So G is one, is this. Yeah, but then this is the number of holes, not the number of handles. Yeah, it's the number of handles. You can build this surface with this, these handles. Don't you see that's the same thing? See? Okay, I take the handle here, and I take the handle here, and bring it over here. You see? Okay? This is all blah blah, but I mean, let's, let's, let's hope. For those of you, and you should be familiar with uh, basic topology, and I'm very upset that there's no decent topology discussion at this place, so we should start at the test of the, the, the correct first definition of the Euler number is the alternating sums of the Betty numbers. The Betty numbers are the dimensions of the singular, I would say, the abelianized homology, or the cohomology. So, and, and this is, you see the Betty number, you see, this is the zero Betty number, the first Betty number, the second Betty number. These are in the triangulation of this thing is the CW complex. This is how these Betty numbers are computed. So, this is really the correct way in modern mathematics to discuss the Euler number. And the order characteristic of any object is the alternating sum of its cohomology dimensions. There are all sorts of order numbers around life, not just in geometry. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, that's an Euler number. And now, let's look at a ramified covering. Oh, I erased it. It's too bad. <laughs> okay. So let's, let me try to write that four to one cover again. So he, oh, let's make one like this. Let's just make a simple one. So something like this. And this is X, and this is Y. And not just a Merrimack function or something. So, Surface X, Riemann surface, holomorphic map from Riemann surface to Y, ramified covering. Okay. Upstairs you have the ramification points. Downstairs you have the branch point. Okay. Now you take a triangle. Let's take a good triangle. Let's do uh, the naive definition. I love it because it's so naive. I love naive things. So this is a triangle. Okay, you see it. I mean, I, I can't draw. <laughs> okay. Now I lift it. Well, let's try. I want to miss this ramification. I lift it. Let, let me... what, what did the student from Congress? Say? Huh? What? What did your student from Congress? Say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> I, I, people don't know me. I had some student who came from Cameroon, and he wasn't very at first wasn't very abstract in mathematics and so on. And I kept drawing these pictures like this. And he kept telling me, but professor, 
A surface doesn't look like that. <laughs> no, really, he was, no, really, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. And so, okay, this is the triangle, and these, these are the lifted triangles. So if you take a downstairs triangle, you lift it and you get four upstairs triangles. Now, I can take a triangulation downstairs, even at the bad point. I can put a corner at the bad point and take the triangulation outside it. So, nevertheless, even though I have ramification involved in this discussion here, I have four triangles above it. The only the statement that I can take a triangulation downstairs with the corners at the branch points. That is a stupid fact. I mean, you can just, this is visually obvious. You can't find out at many points, you just have to do this. Okay. So, we have the order number of, of x, well, equals, let me just say, equals v tilde plus minus e tilde, uh, v tilde edges, plus f tilde. And order character number of y, equals V tilde minus F A E plus F. And now we compute. Okay. Well, F equals F tilde. <laughs> right, because... Yeah, faces are lifted. Faces. Yeah, the faces just go up. And I, I claim also the edges. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I... Uh, the I, faces go up? Yeah, the faces... Sure. The faces go up because I have the same number of triangles downstairs as I have upstairs. Well, how many degree times? Are they multiplied by four? Oh, 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 oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have, I, I divided out by the degree of the math. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So F tilde is four times. Okay. Four times. Yeah. Thanks. Well, maybe I should drink something serious. Okay. Okay, and I claim that same same statement for the edges, because uh, I, only the corners get involved with the uh, ramification, right? So uh, the number of edges goes up. Okay. So that says I'm going to make a mistake here. The topological Euler characteristic upstairs equals the topological Euler characteristic downstairs times the degree of the mapping <laughs> yeah. what is the minus? minus, I've got to make a correction now, right? Yeah. and it's minus, the number we call it is the degree of the ramification set yeah. okay, so let's, minus is right, yeah? yeah? minus the degree of the ramification and now I have to tell you what is uh, the degree. The, the degree, when this is 2, is 1. Right, this is, a, yes? So no ramification means degree 0 ramification. That makes sense, actually, right? Uh, uh, this is no ramification, this is 1 ramification, this is ramification 3. So this is the degree of ramification. So this is sum? Huh? It's a sum. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the sum. Uh, obviously, yeah, I'm sorry. This, this is the sum of over all ramification. Okay, so here, <laughs> let's see what we can get just for fun. I, I have no idea what these numbers are. Euler characteristic upstairs is four times the Euler characteristic downstairs. This is a huge obstruction to mapping. Minus, uh, what, what's going on here? One, Minus two, seven. three, five. Uh, by the way, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I think this can't happen. <laughs> because, as I pointed out to you, ah, might be not more yet. <laughs> no, you see, left, th this thing is an even number. Right is 2 minus 2g. This thing's an even number. <laughs> so this, my, my, my example doesn't happen. No, that's interesting, right? It doesn't happen. You show it. You see what an obstruction is. You draw these little pictures, and most of them don't happen. Yeah. Would it work? Uh, would could it, could that be an uh, example even if the number is even? Uh, yes, indeed. 
That, but that's a very, very, so now, yes indeed, so now uh, you posed a really interesting problem, right? So we have, and this is, this is a problem very close to uh, a problem posed by Grothendieck, which is a problem of, he calls it little pictures or something like this, <laughs> of which little pictures really happen and trying to parameterize somehow, given a little picture, what really happens and how it happens. Yeah? And even in dimension one, it's very interesting. Uh, he has a name for this in French, and I'm it's sorry, I've forgotten. You it's know, it's in the form. Uh, you, you know, yeah, oh, because uh, it's about children. And yeah, the, I mean, the painting of the children. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the form. Yeah, so this is a painting of children. Oh, that's beautiful. So, uh, so there is no function that looks like that. There is no function that looks like that. For example, from the Riemann sphere to the Riemann sphere. No, there are no ramified covering. It has nothing to do with homomorphicity. I didn't use homomorphicity here at all, really. It just doesn't happen because <laughs> yeah, but that, that this rigidity is very is very strong. So I was actually very lucky to get something so that doesn't happen. Not quite sure again that there doesn't exist such a map. There does not exist. Let me write it. <laughs> Since this is even, and this is even. And this is odd. Even equals even minus odd implies doesn't happen. Yeah. So you see what kind of a nice invariant that stuff is. So uh, this is a beautiful formula. This is called the Riemann Hurwitz formula. And uh, it took our giants of our past to prove it, although now we understand really what's. What is there? No question. Is there any reason, like any serious reason, for why they multiply there by two? What is the one minus g? Yes, point correct duality. But but he asked why is the number two there? Yeah. Why is it even? I mean that's what you're asking. Yeah, it's always even. Yeah, let me let me let me look at that. Explain that to you, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know when we started at three forty-five, and we should end at five. So. I, I'm a little bit. That's fine. So I will explain that, and then we'll stop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so why is this topological thing of x an even number? That's that's your question, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow. And here we really use orientability. So you can compute that only for orientable surfaces. Yeah, and you will see why. So maybe <laughs> this doesn't happen. This does happen for non-oriental. I don't know. It's what Tain's saying. I'm not really <coughs> sure of this whole business for non-oriental. I should be really careful. Because otherwise you would consider that the Mobius band has a fold one. And you cannot do that. Right. Well, what, of course, it's not compact. So the first thing to look look at probably is uh, uh, P2R. Okay. When you take the sphere and identify opposite uh, opposites, it'd be interesting to check what's going on there. I, I should know, but the upper hemisphere, huh? The upper hemisphere, or yeah. No, well, no, no, you have the full sphere and you just identify opposite things. Yes. No, because it's, you're identifying on the boundary also. Okay. So it's not quite the upper hemisphere, it's the upper hemisphere compactified yeah, okay. by real projectors somehow. Yeah. It's much uglier than the upper hemisphere. <laughs> I mean, it's not very easy to It's, it's very so funny, it's, right? It's the plane with the line of the Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the easiest way to think of it, I think. That's what it is, P2R. But you know, I think of that as the real points in P2C. And uh, that's my favorite warning is to think of these real structures as the real points in complex structures. Even with the real line, and that's the way Riemann thought, the real line is not the real line, it's the real points in C. And a power series, you should start thinking of that. What is a real power series? What, what is it, yeah? It's really a complex power series. With, with a radius of convergence, right? I mean, uh, 
in C, but restricted to the reals with real coefficients. So I like to think of it that way. Mihai's question was, why is it even? Yeah, um, my answer is not going to be very good, I think. Uh, so the Euler characteristic of x is equal to the alternating dimension of the Betty numbers <clears throat> where bi it depends on what you like to uh, call it. Uh, since some of you had my course last time, let's call this the dimension of the Duranko homology. Uh, the dimension over R, this is all the real Duranko homology of Hj and Durand. But it's the same thing as simply the dimension of uh, the, sing uh, the singular uh, homology, that's right here, singular homology, cohomology. And in this case, there is no torsion in this theory. So there's something called universal coefficient theorem, which tells you about how to relate cohomology and homology. And so this, in this case, is the mention. Maybe let's just say this is really a vector. Uh, of the Z module of the, this H N minus G of X. Okay, this is okay. So going to real coefficients doesn't matter. Now, so <coughs> these two numbers are always equal. <coughs> so the zero cohomology and the zero in the top cohomology is always equal. We talked about that in our class, right, uh, <clears throat> by integration. So this is just a general fact for oriented momentum. <clears throat> and in fancy language, this is a general point of duality. But you really don't need it in this case because it's just duality between the top, top cohomology and the zeroth cohomology. Is that okay? And these two numbers are equal, and since the manifold is one-dimensional, they're one. This number is one because it, it is the connected component of the manifold. This reflects the manifold being connected, and this number is, is one then because the manifold is, is oriented. Okay, so that's, that's the first two here. So that says this thing is 2 minus the second Betty number. Uh, first Betty number. Okay. Now, for those of you uh, who prefer to think in homotopy, I mean, this homology uh, is the first homotopy of Helianized, if this is the way you like to think. I don't know. So here we really have all sorts of things going on that we can use. And this is the interesting thing. You might see some, some involution, which maybe maps one curve on the surface to another curve on the surface. So you might see some natural involution going on on the curves. And this involution, from my point of view, is complex conjugation. Yeah? So complex conjugation acts here. And therefore, this number is. Can, can't we just look at the construction of. Uh, of uh, Who is speaking? Yes, Tim? Can't we just look at the construction of uh, of surfaces of genus G? Like it is uh, 2G, right? So That's right. You will see, you will see, you will see, uh, you will really see it, is what you're saying. So B1 is 2G. That's right. You will see the curves. And it's, but I wanted to, you're absolutely right, of course. Uh, you will see the, the the 2G, but somehow you see the see uh, some involution on the first Betty group that maps one set of curves to another. Now, I see it somehow that way, but what he's saying is just look at the curves. For, you can see the 2G curves, right? You see them, right? So you 
can see this curve. These are, these are, I don't know whether, Riemann, I don't know. Maybe we should even call, I don't know. I, anyway, you should have a base point, but I won't have a base point. Let me not worry about base points. Okay. If you don't worry about base points, you see the fundamental group there. Okay. But I so think through the, the fundamental yes. group and the homology. Are the okay, these are generators of the fundamental group, and uh, there's only one relation. So you will you will see. So you will see that then the four generators of the homology. That these things generate the homology freely. There's no torsion. Okay. <clears throat> you will see one relation. Okay. Uh, we can get into this if you like. Uh, especially if you're interested in billiards, we can talk about this in a serious way. Uh, people are interested in hyperbolic billiards, which means that, uh, I'm sorry, but maybe you're not, other people aren't interested, but uh, I could tell you something here. Uh, uh, there are fundamental results here. If you take uh, a Riemann surface, uh, its universal cover, as you know, is the unit disk. This is a very important theory. And <clears throat> this is Riemann mapping theorem in some sense in higher variable. And the next remark is the unit disk has the Poincaré metric on it, this uh, very famous method that you know. And in the, it's a unique invariant metric for the transformations of the uh, unit disk. The biholomorphic transformations of the unit disk. Then you ask the naive question, which is highly non trivial. Does every element of the fundamental group, an element of the fundamental group is an equivalence class of loops? Right? Does every element, uh, does every equivalence class have a curve of minimal length. And if it is a geodesic, the answer is yes. And so you say, I'm incredibly happy. I'm just going to forget the uh, fundamental group stuff. I'm just going to use the geodesics. Then you say, where are these things geodesics? Well, the, the metric on the, on the Riemann surface of genus 2, for example, is the same as the metric on the disk. So you say, well, okay, I look at the geodesics on the disk. Of course, they're periodic because the, the group action from the universal cover to the uh, Riemann surface is, uh, stabilizes the picture. So, and these geodesics, of course, perpendicular to the boundary. So, but the fundamental region for, the, for this group action looks like this. It's perpendicular to the boundary. Then this is perpendicular to the boundary. Then this is perpendicular to the boundary. Then this is perpendicular to the boundary. I won't get the number right, and I don't care right now because this is just a qualitative statement. But you get then a compact fundamental region for this thing, bounded by pieces of geodesic. Uh, by the way, I didn't. <laughs> My number is always five. I think one, two. No, wait. Six. One, two. Oh, six. Let me. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, this is, uh, these things come in pairs. Riemann called the A, the A geodesics and the B geodesics. In every country in the world, there's the AB. Yes, and the, the relation is more or less of the type, uh, uh, this type. I don't know. I think this is the relation of the AB geodesics. And now the interesting thing, which is uh, interested by, interesting to physicists and many people, is to play billiards on this thing. This has to do with a lot of very, very deep properties of uh, the length spectrum of, of uh, the geodesics, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, and many deep things uh, about dynamics of this thing. Now the dynamics of this thing is, of course, you, uh, don't forget, that uh, these things are identified here. This is a fundamental region. So, I, I mean, this, will, this, this thing's going to bounce off of here because it's a, then it goes over to here, and then it goes to here, and here, and here, and here. This becomes a very interesting dynamical system on the universal cover, which really is related to the Riemann surface of genes. Now, 
Now, I have friends and colleagues who even take special Riemann surfaces of genus 2, which we will, or genus 4, but genus, they're already in genus 2, there's some beautiful examples, and are interested in the properties of this billiards as related to physical phenomena. It's very fantastic. Very fantastic. And I'm telling you, almost nothing has been proved, and maybe nothing can be proved. It's very, very tough stuff. Um, but uh, so you see, even though this looks very trivial, <laughs> the minute you start asking things like this, we get into some very nice questions. So were there any other nice questions? Santel, you okay on this stuff now? I mean, this is just back stuff here. No, I mean, after we go to this, um, the Billy's question, I kind of understand. No, not yet, no. But it, 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 it's interesting to notice. Uh, you know, the first people who talk about billiards is, is maybe this kind of billiard table. And you talk about a linear, a linear, well, you know, you play, <laughs> you play billiards and it goes in a line, and, and then you, it goes over here and then so on. Well, this is not linear billiards. These, these are just the lines of the geodesics of the, uh, of the Riemann surface, right? And uh, they bounce around off this fundamental region. They're going around here in the Riemann surface. Yeah. It's very beautiful. And uh, there's a, like, when I see that thing, that picture with two, with a loop, with a... Uh, which one? This one? The, the one with genus two, yeah. Yeah, that thing, uh, it, it, rem like, it reminds me of physics or of chemistry orbitals for electrons. That's a, and is, is that the question of billiards, how the electrons go? No, no, no. No? No. Um, no. Uh, it may be that I think you were looking at uh, some kind of S orbital. Uh, I mean, P orbital. Uh, no, that, yeah, that's actually a P orbital. A cloud. Yeah. It, it is a cloud, basically. It, Electron doesn't have a hole inside it over there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the cloud it occupies everything. Oh, okay. What I, I can only tell you what some of my friends are interested in here. The the classical system what we're talking about here is this dynamical system, and they're interested in the quantum limit of this system. So, the, 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 what is the quantum the quantized version of this? And this is these kind of things are very much related to what is called the length spectrum of the geodesic. So the question is, how many geodesics do you have uh, of a given length, or less than or equal to a given length? And of course, you see, you have this geodesic, but then you have a uh, closed geodesic or something. Then you have another one much longer. It's very possible, right? So you look at the asymptotics of that. So you scale that, and somehow uh, understand these what's called the length spectrum, you can understand the relation between that, those things and the dynamics of this dynamical system. And even that part of it, I mean, I don't understand any physics, but that part of it is also very, very interesting. So we could, uh, if you get interested in this, I could uh, maybe talk about this in halfway seriousness. And, uh, and we can invite one of my physics friends up here to give a lecture on this stuff. Hey, do you know about this stuff? I mean, you, you were studying I you were physics. physics. You were a physicist? Yeah. Good. Okay, see you tomorrow at 9.30.